good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, you are welcome, uh, all of you who have joined us today for our last session of the uh, of this round, round three, on the national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. A special thanks and appreciation to those who attended the three rounds, including this last session. My name is Luca Byungdeng Kual. I am the academic dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and a faculty lead of this program on national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. And I will be moderating uh, this last session. Let me, before I move on, let me just share with you some of the highlights of partnership. Maybe the, the most important question, why budget is so critical tool for the implementation of national security strategy. Budget is the most important public document that reflects not only the intentions of government in terms of policy, but also its priorities in terms of resource allocation and its actions and behavior, public expenditure management. These are very important you to test the behavior of the government in adhering to the issue of governance. The document is actual, the, the, is the document that mirrors the relationship between citizens in terms of their needs, priorities, preferences, and taxes that they pay, and their governments in terms of policies and resource allocation, and transparent and accountable management of public expenditure. So budget is not a technical document that, real, that merely reflects revenue collection and expenditure decision, but it is a political document that reflects the public preferences and priorities of those members of society who will be served by and included in the funding of public programs. Given the competitive demands for constrained resources, the allocation of resources among different sectors become a political decision that should ideally be shaped by the needs and preferences of the electorate, the citizen. This makes the principle of contestability as articulated by Dr. Johnson, so relevant to the development and implementation of national security strategy. If national security strategy reflects the needs and preferences of citizens through an inclusive and participatory process, the allocation of resources for its implementation will be justifiable and sustainable. If the allocation of public resource is not guided by public policy, that reflect the needs of citizens, the use of such resources for implementing such irrelevant public policy will lead to failure and dissatisfactions of citizens in their uh, governments. There's a new approach now initiated by the World Bank for moving budgeting process away from regime or people-centered or government-centered to citizen-centered, so as to ensure participation of citizens in the entire budgeting process. The second question is why external assistance is important for the implementation of national security strategy. The nature of security today, the nature of security threat that face most of the African countries are transnational in nature. That requires collective response, not only at the national level, but also at the regional, continental, and international level. So the insecurity caused by these transnational threats in Africa are the, are, the threat of, are the threat to the national security of the developed countries as well. As such, the security assistance provided by the developed countries to African countries is not a free lunch, but it is part of their strategic interest to deliver security to their citizens. So security assistance to African countries is not free but it is not easily accessible as it is limited and with competitive demands by African countries. As rightly articulated by Ambassador Carter, the security assistance has not been successful in improving 
impact in improving governance in the security sector in Africa. This is attributed partially to the self-interest and narrow approach in, developing, in delivering such assistance. But it is largely because of lack of inclusive and citizen-centered national security policy to provide strategic guidance and align security assistance to national security priorities. Some countries in Africa, such as Senegal, uh, decided to, to include not only its neighbors, neighboring countries, but also its strategic security partners in the process of developing national security strategies. This is extremely important, not only to allay fears of the neighboring countries, but also to ensure transparency in the process and buying in of strategic security partners. In some countries, the process of national security strategy development resulted in developing aid coordination strategy, not only between government and donors, but also among donors. So a well-designed and inclusive national security process is likely to align security assistance to achieve national security of priorities and indeed may contribute to improving governance in security sector. Now, let me now give you the main objective of this session. This session is about national security strategy, civilian oversight and monitoring and periodic review. So we have three objectives. The first objective of this session is to discuss how having a national security can help to improve civilian oversight of the security sector in delivering security to the citizens. The second objective, to examine how a national security strategy implementation monitoring system can adjust and respond to an anticipated threat, such as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in iterative way. The, the third objective is to discuss how often a national security strategy will ideally be reviewed and evaluated in light of the national security strategy implementation system uh, monitoring mechanism. So let me introduce now the panelists. I am delighted to, 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 to welcome uh, outstanding and seasoned experts on the monitoring and evaluation and civilian oversight today. And, and definitely they will help us on these very important aspects of monitoring and civilian oversight. You have the bios, so I will highlight some of the relevant expertise, experience and qualifications. Let me start first with Captain Joaquim Santos. Um, he served as a senior Portuguese representative at the Africa Center. Before joining the Africa Center, he served as an executive assistant and advisor of the Angola Naval Academy commander in, in Luanda. He was the commander of the Portuguese Marine School and dual commander of the Portuguese Marine Corps. He served as head of department of psychology and lecturer at the Portuguese Naval Academy. He holds a PhD in management and organizational behavior from the Institute of Web and, Expert and Enterprise Science in Lisbon. He holds also a master's degree uh, in organizational behavior from the Institute of Applied Psychology in, in Lisbon. He has published widely several articles, peer review articles on leadership development and training. So you are welcome, uh, Dr. Joaquim, for being, together, for being with, with us today. The second uh, uh, panelist is Honorable Jefferson Panma. He is the National Security Advisor to the President of Liberia. He served as a member and a ranking member of the Committee on National Security and Intelligence, also a Committee on Foreign Affairs, and a Committee on Ways, Means, and Finance of the House of Representatives of Liberia. He, he served also as a member and a third deputy speaker for the ECOWAS Parliament. Um, and he holds a bachelor degree in public affairs and economics from the University of Liberia. So Honorable Jefferson, you are most welcome to be with us today. And the last and not the least is somebody who we have been introducing you, how to you, um, uh, is, uh, is Dr. Fairley. He's an independent expert in conflict and security 
and she is the one who reviewed our national security site development toolkit. She is a, a rostered expert for the international security sector advisory team, and she worked at the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, known as DECAF, a, a world-leading center uh, in security governance. And she holds a master's degree from Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctorate from the Otto Super Institute of Political Science at the Freire University in Berlin. Uh, Freire, you are most, Dr. Freire, you are most welcome again with us today. So let me start now with the, um, with my conversation. I want to start with, with um, um, Captain Joachim. Joachim, based on your experience, uh, can you share with the participant in a simple way, the key concept of monitoring and evaluation? And why do you think these concepts are very important during the implementation of any public policy? And for this case, uh, for the uh, national security strategy. Uh, Joaquin, you are most welcome. Please, within six to seven minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning, participants. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm not a specialist in implementation of public policy, but in my professional career and academic career, I participated in many processes of this kind and in the implementation of various projects. And I wanted to share this with you. The concepts of monitoring are connected to the uh, concepts of management. And in the last phase, we talk about the phase of control. In our case, we wanna talk about implementation and strategy of national security which um, involves the ministries of state and other actors of civil society. The process, this whole cycle involves four phases. The first being planning, which can be the phase of organization. And then the uh, phase of direction, which can be implementation. And then we are in the phase of control, wherein we can observe in the uh, model that will be described by um, Dr. Johnson, who was described by Dr. Johnson last week. Revision is an action that occurs during the control phase. However, we can't forget that monitoring is intimately linked with the previous phases of management. This might be strange, but in monitoring and evaluate, evaluating, this begins with the planning phase of any strategy. And this is especially true in the case of uh, implementation of a national security strategy. The implementation of this uh, strategy, as we have saw, saw before, is to reach objectives and also, we should reach, establish deadlines and to characterize the means that we use to reach these deadlines. These are very important in um, bringing to the fore our objectives and that the objectives be clear so that everything is clear and concrete to the implementers. We have to define as an objective uh, and not just maintain things as theory. It's best to refer to the objectives with great objectivity. And our, our implementation will be much more robust in this case. For example, the level of implementation in the creation of these institutions and the ex execution of budgetary uh, implementation are some examples and indicators, objective indicators that we can look to. And I uh, also emphasize that without 
these indicators. Um, we don't do proper monitoring and implementation. As I said before, after planning in the organization phase, we have to um, use the, uh, the functions of the proper ministries and we define exactly who does what. We have the allocation of resources and establish functional relationships between the various actors in the process, which helps in the coordination. There's the preparation phase of the process, which takes us to what I call a basic uh, tool, which is the matrix of implementation, which maps out specifically what should be done. These are basic tools so that there is a correct monitoring and evaluation of the process. And it's very important during this phase of, of implementation that the larger problems be looked at. Some of the common problems would be the lack of financial resources and also technical tools. We also have to look at new problems, uh, sectoral strategies, and many things aren't implemented because they weren't properly conceived. Also, there might be a lack of um, proper means of implementation, which takes us to the control phase, which is the last phase of uh, management, which involves evaluation and the revision of some sectoral uh, phases. And this means follow-up, observation, and the systematic registering of what's taking place. And we ha have to put this in context and use what I talked about, the um, matrix of implementation and the scheduling matrix. This is in essence, a cooperative process. And when we go through these, uh, establishing these objectives, we reach our results. Now, going to the second part of your question, why is monitoring and evaluation important during the implementation of a national security policy? I would say that there are two objectives that are normally used in the evaluation. The first in the evaluation is to make responsible accountable those who are behind the plan. The other that's very important is to properly calibrate the process, know exactly what's happening, whether the results are following a given schedule and whether we have the wherewithal to reach our objectives. And it's on the basis of this proper evaluation that we analyze the sectoral inputs. And we also see that some measures um, don't uh, yield the proper objectives, the objectives we want, but an evaluation would allow us to see what we can adapt what we can adopt to implement a proper method. And the evaluation uh, agencies look at the successes and can eventually better apply resources and revise the national security strategy. This um, corresponds to an iterative process and also of um, a learning process, and it's a process that's in constant evolution. We use these factors and consider them in constant, constant state of change. And this is the way we evaluate these concepts. And when we follow these deadlines, for example, Unless we do so, it doesn't help us resolve these problems. Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Joachim, uh, for, for this uh, explanation. And I think one of the things that you raise, and this is very important, the issue of um, developing indicators. I think when we're talking about the monitoring and evaluation, we're talking about the information system. And how can we be able to gauge our objective through the implementation with indicators that can, we can agree upon from the beginning and during the implementation. There should not be, be surprises. And I think one of the things that I would like to, to share with the participant as well, uh, there are very many system, internationally uh, system of barometers. And especially if you look at the Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim uh, uh, Index of African governance, it is a very important indicator that is asking people about how they feel about the, the governments. And in some countries, I think, I believe like Rwanda, they managed to develop the, um, a, a survey to assess the people feeling about the security, the security being delivered to them. And this is very important so that you can be able to see whether to what level the, your policy is being implemented and is meeting the needs of the citizen. So the information system is extremely very important in the implementation and even the, the matrix. And, um, and thank you very much Irene, for highlighting the importance of information system in the implementation. And now the last question is, uh, can you share with the, uh, we know monitoring and evaluation is such a very uphill task and, and usually faces uh, a lot of challenges. Can you highlight some of the key challenges during the monitoring and evaluation of uh, public policy such, such as national security and how to overcome some of these challenges? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Luca. I'm gonna to try to answer your question in brief. The greatest uh, challenges for a national security strategy result basically in not respecting the basic principles that are part of the evaluation process. We're talking here about indi indicators, very well-defined indicators, a committee, a, an evaluation committee, committee that's used, that proceeds with this evaluation, an evaluation that is impartial and a transparent and open process. One of the first basic aspects of this is that these conditions um, be applied. And we also have to look at the culture of secrecy that prevails in many countries. And these are considered many times these factors uh, part of defense and security and are hidden from public scrutiny. And so civil society has to take part, however, in this culture of secrecy that's associated with um, civil society and the security forces. This causes a lack of trust and reluctance on the part of uh, the public to believe in uh, their government. And it represents an, ob an obstacle before some of these public policies. But the secrecy um, can only be justified in operational terms, but not strategic as we're talking about, especially in terms of uh, national security uh, strategies, which should be transparent. We should also uh, take in account that these changes are important in terms of national security, and there has to be a reorientation of priorities, which could otherwise uh, yield a loss of resources in some sectors. And we have to avoid um, any resistance on the part of the public. And there are ways of combating this, which is to involve all sectors of society in the involvement of uh, the sectors of government. And it's frequent, we should look at evaluation as a way of oversight, but not as a way of instituting secrecy. And we should collaborate in every way in the process of evaluation. The evaluation committees must um, apply these principles so that they can carry out their work. And when the law doesn't allow uh, the uh, offering of these uh, 
of this information, it works uh, contrary to um, the position of the evaluation committee. The necessary choices and technical capability. This is the best way to control. We should expand and, and make it a little bit more democratic, this process. So this can be a national subject, so everybody can talk about it. First of all, we should go like um, traditional concepts that are associated with defense security. And we should also have a holistic concept for human security. And it should be in every part of society. We also bring in to the table all the stakeholders, uh, not only the government, but all their sectors of society. This is an interest and responsibility for all. So we need every representative from society. This is a fundamental moment. As we say, this is part of strate strategy, but we also need to implement it. And finally, to evaluate is effi efficiency, because uh, an efficiency of a national security strategy is fundamental. Security and development is important for all the society. Well, thank you, Luca. I'll give you the floor. Oh, oh thank you very much, uh, Joaquim. I think you answered them very well, and this, um, you have provided a very good material for the uh, for the participant. I think one thing, the issue of secrecy, and what you are highlighting, this is a very big challenge. And this has something to do with the right to know, to know access to the public information. And this sometimes it needs to be regulated by the uh, by the legislature in order to what 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 a, a public should know and what they should not know and it should be regulated by it because if you have to have a public policy that is being implemented transparency and as we said many times then the people should have access to the information and i think i just want to to highlight to the to the participant and that the fact that the security sector expenditure is actually is accessible because there's a commitment by the member state to make the, the military expenditure to be availed to the UN as a way of creating transparency on the year. So the right of citizens to access public information is a fundamental issue in the monitoring and evaluation. Thank you very much, Joaquin, for, answer, for, for, for providing this one. Now let us move now to Honorable Jefferson. As I mentioned, he, he is somebody coming with a first-hand information, not only being a national security advisor, but he's somebody who sat on a very important committees in the parliament, the two parliament, the regional parliament and the national parliament. And he, especially the committee on security intelligence and, but he sat also on a committee on finance means and ways. So he's, we, and, and, and for the uh, participant, I think we provide you the case study of, of Liberia, national security strategy of Liberia, which is one of the good case studies uh, that I would, we would really refer you to. to. Um, Honorable Jefferson, uh, based, based on such experience that you have um, in the security sector, uh, can you just in a, in a brief way, the, the role of parliament in overseeing the security sector and why such a role is so important and in, in improving uh, security governance and delivering better the security to the citizen? Uh, Honorable uh, Jefferson, you are welcome. The, the role of parliament in generally outside of our uh, state institution as uh, is a constitutional mandate and uh, which is reinforced by our national security strategy uh, against the background uh, of uh, against the backgrounds of governance in our country uh, crisis uh, before the civil crisis in Liberia, the, a country uh, was ruled by one party state over a century, where the opposing view were uh, view from the opposition were truncated. Uh, civil society was non-existent. Uh, security were driven by narrow. Uh, 
uh, militaristic and state-centric uh, uh, notion of security, which privileged the regime and, and, and the state above societal and human security. So we want to characterize by intimidation, brutalization, terrorize the people, disrespect the abuse in the human and civil rights of the general citizenry. So after uh, uh, this situation was exacerbated by the war in which uh, security institutions were fashionalized, and therefore that fashional. So growing out of the war, the need for the democratization of broader society uh, was, uh, could, not be, uh, could not be overemphasized. And, um, and more so, uh, the democratization of the state institution of violence, the military, the police, uh, was critical to the democratic growth of the country. So, uh, all the state actors, including Fushbury of the government, even before the elections of 2005 uh, that brought in the early Joseph Ali government, uh, the, the transitional government that, uh, that was a precursor to that government, uh, took the time to bring in all state actors, uh, civil society actors, the press, the media, uh, the bar association, other professional bodies were all involved in ensuring that the pillows, the structure for effective democratic governance was in place before the nurturing in, the ushering in of the first post war democratic government under Ellen Business Ali. Uh, so, as a consequence of the, uh, the comprehensive peace accord, uh, comprehensive peace accord that was. Uh, uh, consummated in Accra, the decision was taken that the entire military and other states will be restructured. In fact, the armed forces labor were dissolved and it was built on from scratch. So all of the pillows for transparency, for uh, equal access to opportunities for regional balance, all of these indicators that were pinpointed to be the the people that have negative influences on the security institution, therefore, the peace and security of the country were, were, were highlighted, there were the need to address them. So, the national security, the national security strategy as it involved took into consideration all of those, in addition to what was constitutionally stipulated that the military or security forces but answerable, and accountable to civilian authority through the representative of the people, which is the, the parliament. And one of the, 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 the important instruments through which parliament exercises uh, of all sides is through the control of the purse, allocation of resources to other security institutions. There's no public fund that is expended by one of the institutions outside of government appropriation, uh, say for donor contribution and external support for all public funds in Liberia. Uh, it, it is important because as the commerce goes, one will control the price control the papa. So uh, provide a review of uh, military institutions, state security, the intelligent agency through aside from periodic public hearings, uh, uh, citation to parliament to address issue of uh, immediate or public concern. Those are the power the parliament has to, to ensure that the institution are supervised and that, uh, and, and that institution that are established by acts of national legislation to enable uh, the effective execution of the national security strategy those enabling legislation, those enabling statutes are also uh, monitored through, through uh, periodic public, uh, uh, public hearings. Because, for instance, they established uh, the Small Arms Commission, established the Small Arms Commission, was driven by the collaborative efforts of surveillance population, 
and uh, our partner, especially West Africa uh, Equus Commission. The, uh, the, the composition of the Small Air Commission also has uh, a representation from the civil society, uh, the Bar Association. The Bar Association also plays a very important role in, in fact, the Bar Association chairs the Surveillance Complaint Board of the Liberal National Police. So all of these uh, 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 civil society actors uh, are critical in ensuring that state institutions, especially one that have cohesive powers, are accountable to the people. In the case of parliament, uh, we ensure the parliament try to ensure uh, they ensure that this the, the establishment of the institution, the legislation that went into the establishment of the small hand commission, uh, the financial intelligence unit, the Liberian Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, are all in coincidence with surveillance population, uh, surveillance participation, uh, surveillance civil society, selected civil society institution that has uh, topic specific to the area of, 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 of concern. Uh, incorporated uh, in, in, in ensuring that uh, the supervision is done. So as besides from the parliament exercising control through public hearings, allocation, they are dedicated, parliament have dedicated some of its oversight responsibilities of civil society organizations to help uh, reinforce. So it's not only limited to within. So through the legislation, they dedicated some of the powers to by association, for instance, to take responsibility in supervising, and uh, the, 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 the press union of Liberia are uh, uh, taking part in ensuring that on the Commission for Public Information Act, members of the press union are, 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 in fact, the press union chairs that, that commission to ensure that the state yeah. institution uh, answer yeah. to the people wherever people may request, they says that you must provide uh, if we shut off strategic national national security concern. Yeah. No, Honorable, you have really elaborated very well. I think one of the points that you raised very well is the uh, the control of the press, and I think these are very important. And the most important, what you said also, this idea of the uh, the constitutionalism of the civilian oversight. It is not; it is a constitutional obligation. It's a, it's a constitutional requirement. And I think one point you raised also, and is very important for the participant, a budget. Is, is actually a law, is an act. It is what is called appropriation acts. And if you deviate from the implementing a budget, you are actually violating a law. And I think it is very important because people also to understand it is good the way you, and I thank you very much also for, uh, for sharing with us also the way the parliament managed to involve the other actors for this for the civilian oversight. Uh, I believe uh, um, participant would be asked, will be, be able to ask many questions. Please, I ask you, if you want to ask questions, uh, you can you can you can write in in the chat function, so that we can be able to handle them as many questions as possible. So the the last question, um, um, Honorable, I believe overseeing security sector is not a, an easy job. And based on your personal experience uh, sitting on these different committees, what are some of the challenges for the parliamentarian to oversee the security sector? that is having a culture of secrecy, a culture of this no go, go zone area for the civilian. What are some of the challenges that you have encountered and how did you manage to overcome some of these challenges? Please in brief, um, yeah, in about five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the question of our secrecy is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a impediment. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, when those public areas are called, uh, the issue of secrecy involved, uh, then those hearings are, are held beyond closed doors, uh, uh, also declared of the public, uh, beyond closed doors, uh, where uh, Parliament uh, wants to conduct audits. Uh, sometimes the secrecy laws are in full. Uh, but uh, over time, we learn to, to dialogue and define what those national security concerns as that, 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 that demand to be restricted into secrecy. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the disagreement, uh, there's a tail line between the, 
allowing the representative of the people to have access to information uh, and, and, and trying to hide conceal those information on a on a canopy of state security. So, but there's always dialogue through which uh, we, we we navigate the issues and find other alternative means of resolution. Yeah, some of the the handicap in recent time on the exercise of oversight uh, being the, the question of uh, resources. Even parliament do control the price sometimes do not have the allotment for themselves to make fee visitation, uh, to make uh, travel to areas uh, hard to reach. And so the issue of finance, uh, financial resources is a problem. Uh, from, the in, from the inception, the uh, parliamentary body were well supported by donors because the on May forces the United Nations were here in the formative stages. Uh, of this committee to finalize some of the committee work. But with all the resources dribbling, uh, 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 the national press cannot uh, handle all of these uh, things that the parliament will want to, to undertake financially. So those are some of the impediments. Oh, oh thank you very much, um, uh, Honorable uh, Jefferson. I, I think that we'll, we'll have more discussing with you, definitely. Um, now, let me move to... Uh, to um, to the uh, to Dr. Feli, uh, Dr. Feli, um, given the, your work uh, with DCAV and also reviewing the toolkit, and I think the um, uh, Honorable Jefferson highlighted some of the actors, uh, but I, it would be good if you can also highlight some of the um, uh, the civilian actors um, uh, besides the Parliament that are to be engaged in overseeing security sector. And if you can highlight also some of the role um, and how they can contribute improving the security governance. Uh, uh, Fairly, Dr. Fairly, you're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Um, essentially, democratic oversight is a little bit like a fishing net. There's, there's lots of different pieces and they interlock in different ways. So there's, besides the parliament, which is obviously a key actor in uh, democratic oversight, there's really five different um, layers or different kinds of civilian oversight uh, or, or monitoring for the security sector in a democracy. Uh, the first one is really internal management structures inside security forces. That's where democratic oversight starts. So that means um, line managers, uh, the people who are simply at the most, at the lowest level responsible for ensuring that every agent of the state does their job the way that they're supposed to, according to whatever standards of discipline or regulations or codes of conduct exist. So line managers in the military or the police, that might be the chain of command, having um, a professional service whereby uh, standards of behavior are enforced inside the security forces is the first layer of uh, democratic oversight. Um, and that includes inside those services or inside those institutions, a second aspect, which is internal independent oversight. So that can be your professional conduct units, that might be independent inspection units, that might be management investigations, internal audits, all of those sort of higher level management functions that exist inside institutions to uphold certain standards of behavior. The second type of oversight um, is one layer above the security institution itself, and that's executive oversight. So that means the ways in which we expect security forces to report to line ministries. So the way in which, for example, the armed forces will be subject um, to the management and oversight of a ministry of defense, the way a police force might be subject to a ministry of justice or a ministry of interior or a ministry of public security, depending on the context. And then the way in which that line ministry is then responsible to the head of government, whether it's a prime minister or president, and also whether or not there might be, for example, a layer in between a national security council, for example, or a security advisor, um, all of these layers of executive oversight, which are responsible for formulating policy, but also monitoring and ensuring that policy is implemented and followed up. 
And then another layer of um, executive oversight, which we've talked a lot about so far, is also relates to finances. So budget accountability and the Ministry of Finance, for example, or the Department of Finance is going to be a key actor in democratic oversight on the executive side. The third kind of democratic oversight is that which is provided by independent statutory organizations. So these are the institutions that are state-based, but under the law have an independent mandate to oversee some aspect of governance. It might be specific to the security forces. So for example, if you have an ombudsman's office that focuses only on the activities of the armed forces, or it might be um, an independent organization with a more general remit. So for example, a governance commission, a human rights council, an anti-corruption commission, all of these are examples of institutions that have independent mandates for oversight, which touch on activities of the security sector and therefore can, they can become really important oversight actors. The fourth uh, mechanism for oversight is judicial oversight. So this means two things. This means on the one hand, in the justice system, whenever there is a case of misbehavior of, of the law being broken, of, of uh, criminal activities by um, a per personnel of the security sector or in any of the management or ministries responsible for it, the justice system is judicial oversight as part of prosecuting those, those crimes and making sure that there is um, not impunity for, for those actions. But then a second aspect of judicial oversight involves um, overseeing whether or not the laws and the policies and the regulations that are created to manage the security sector are actually um, in line with the constitutional principles of the nation. So verifying the legality and the legitimacy of um, the approach that the government or the security forces are taking in their work. So that has two aspects to judicial oversight. And then finally, the fifth one, um, which we've just heard a lot about in the case of Liberia, which is really useful, is public oversight. So this is the role of, on the one hand, the media, on the other hand, civil society, and finally, citizens themselves, the public themselves are important actors in public oversight. And we've heard some examples here from, for example, how uh, the Liberian Bar Association or the Press Union is involved in different formal structured ways in parliamentary oversight, for example, being acting as a resource acting as a source of education, for example. Um, but there are other ways that this can happen. So for example, with the media, it's incredibly important to have a critical but respectful public discussion of decisions and around security provision and, and management in the public sphere. And this, is, this really highlights how public oversight, it's really important to understand that this has to be a two-way communication. It's not the security sector or the government telling the community or the population how they should see or understand or perceive security. That's only one way. It also has to be the government, the security, listening to the media, to the civil society, to citizens about what the needs for security are and about whether or not they're satisfied with, what, with the public service provision they're receiving. So that's those five um, points of oversight, internal management, executive oversight, independent statutory oversight, judicial oversight, and public oversight. And then we have parliamentary oversight as well. So oh, thank you very much, uh, Victor Fele, for such elaborate, elaboration of the uh, of different actors. And I think that's a good point, the two-way communication between the, uh, in the security sector, especially with this, in the, in the light of lack of confidence by civil society being um, we have a lot of suspicion about the role of civil society. I think this communication is extremely very important. Uh, maybe you have the second question, Bill, on what Joachim uh, said about the monitoring system and, and, and for the implementation of national security strategy. Um, like, uh, can, you, can you other forms of monitoring system and, and how the designation of this role and functions of monitoring of security sector to a national body uh, can you share with us these these uh, other other mechanism and system of monitoring? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, every system is a little bit different um, in terms of how it manages security on an institutional basis. So wherever the national how where how the national security strategy is initiated and drafted and implemented in a national context will obviously have an effect on where the 
responsibility for monitoring its implementation is going to be placed. And there's actually quite a lot of uh, variability around that. So for example, um, a drafting committee can become a monitoring body, for example, it can uh, may receive, for example, a high level political mandate, and then become the, responsible for monitoring the implementation of the document that it created. Um, it might be that, for example, an executive authority is often responsible for monitoring the implementation of a national security strategy. But that can mean several things. That might mean that there's a lead ministry, for example, who, that takes responsibility for overseeing the strategy. It might be that there's a higher level political office with uh, a mandate for coordination, um, for example, National Security Council. It might be that this is managed um, directly from the office of, of an executive authority, whether it's a prime minister or the president's office, for example. It can also be the case in, in some contexts, there might be a parliamentary commission, for example, that has a mandate for security monitoring, which can become the monitoring body for a national security strategy. That can be either a commission that has a standing mandate, like a commission for defense and armed forces, for example, or it could be an ad hoc parliamentary committee that might be created specifically for that purpose. And then finally, it might be that there's an independent an oversight body um, and this can happen sometimes in some contexts where perhaps um, a think tank or an external civil society organization might have been um, tasked with leading the drafting of a national security strategy for example they might then become responsible also for monitoring its implementation and in Liberia this happened as well where what was called the governance reform commission was subsequently tasked with monitoring implementation of the security sector of the security strategy um, what's important though is it's less it's, it's it's really important to understand it's not really important where institutionally um, the responsibility for monitoring is placed what is important is that the qualities of monitor of the monitoring system um, are in place for it to do its job well and that requires several things the first one is Whoever is responsible for monitoring, they need to be given direct responsibility for that task at the very highest level. They need to have a clear mandate um, and the process and responsibilities for fulfilling that task, as well as the necessary resources, have to be made available. Um, and that involves um, support at the very highest political level, usually. The same way that we say you have to have high level political buy-in to create a national security strategy, you have to have high level, high level political buy-in to monitor its implementation. And that relates to the second point is that whoever, um, whoever is, in, is responsible for this monitoring, they need to have certain powers. They need to have, um, pub it needs to be, there needs to be public communication around the monitoring role so that there can be a national discussion. But it's also helpful if they have power to make recommendations and the political ability or the authority to resolve conflicts and to, and to move past certain impasses and implementation if they arise. And that's related also then to another aspect, which is legitimacy. Whoever is involved in monitoring the implementation of the strategy they need to have the knowledge, they need to have the right attitude, they need to have res respect from the, from the security sector and from the public as a whole, and they need to work with an inclusive approach. So involving security, civil society, involving the public, taking a broader approach, um, because those all become sources of legitimacy. And then finally, access to information is absolutely critical for an effective monitoring process. So where the monitoring authority sits within the system, will depend on um, or will have an effect on the access to information that the monitoring authority can have. That involves confronting the problem of secrecy. Um, I saw we had a quick a question in the, in the chat about this. Um, of course, the details of implementation of a national security strategy might be secret, but there are ways to make sure that monitoring can be um, can be effective within a closed sphere of people who have the appropriate security clearances, who've been vetted for the task, and who can be legitimate in their oversight role whilst also respecting operational secrecy. 
but it's also important that the people who are involved in monitoring for access of information, they need to have the right technical knowledge to understand the different levels that they're working with. And finally, they need to have the right attitude. That means they need to be sufficiently assertive to confront perhaps powerful vested interests about what they're doing or not doing in the, um, in the implementation of the strategy. So that was a bit of a long answer, but hopefully useful. <laughs> No, I, 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 yeah, I think it's excellent. I think this is what we need. I think this is, and I think for the uh, for the participants, some of these issues are in the toolkit, but these are this is very important. I think the, and I guess I want to highlight what he said also about the issue of the uh, having the right technical knowledge and the right attitude in monitoring is extremely very important because especially in a in a sector that is rather very difficult with a lot of of secrecy and for you to navigate. You may need to have those skills, and uh, and uh, I think that's a very important to be listened to, and listen as well. I think this is a very a very important, and then this this political support, and political support and legitimacy. I think it's very important for the monitoring system to function, and to have the access to information. Thank you very much. Maybe briefly, uh, fairly, fairly, and the last question is is often is very elusive question, and it's very difficult to provide. Uh, one answer for it, but I think for the sake for the participant, um, how often do you think national security strategy to be evaluated or reviewed? Yeah, this is this is a difficult question, and of of course, again, it's another question that depends on the context. Um, each context is going to be slightly different, but there are some principles that are important for this. Here, you'll see um, we have a slide that's a graphic from the toolkit, which is part of the implementation and monitoring cycle. You can see how in the first part, um, there's the monitoring authority that coordinates um, the implementation among different stakeholders. There's then sectoral strategies for implementation that have to be put in place. Then pro progress on implementation is monitored according to whatever mechanism the national security strategy defines. And finally, there's this implementation process that incorporates learning and experiences and makes the national security strategy making process into a living process and iterative process so that it's a living document that is constantly being adapted to the national security uh, context and to the, the in, in view of the resources and the capacities for the actors that are involved. So in reality, what does that mean? What that means is um, there's going to have to be a strategy. Everybody has to align to the strategy. At some point, it will have to be reviewed. Now, a strategy can be reviewed too often. And that is not helpful because it is a very resource intensive process um, and because also national security requires long term planning um, across different aspects, including, for example, recruitment and procurement and infrastructure development. These are longer term planning processes that need to be taken account into account in the security strategy planning process and in the review, but which function perhaps on a different timeline. So if the strategy is changing too often, it's not going to work well according to that more long-term approach. Um, at the same time, not reviewing your strategy often enough is going to lead to inefficiencies and it can be dangerous because you might end up in a situation where the security sector is not equipped um, or is not anticipating the changes in the security environment that it needs to adapt to. Um, so the question then is um, it needs to be often enough to ensure that the necessary changes are occurring to assess effectiveness. So how do you make security forces more effective on a mid to short to short to midterm basis and in the long term? So this can depend. Sometimes when national security strategies are developed, they come with a predefined timeline, for example, five years. And if this is the case, then it's often that there might be a midterm review and a final review of implementation when the sort of use by date on the strategy um, expires. It might be, or it's, it's good practice, if the drafting committee has developed an implementation matrix, that then the implementation matrix, for example, will define milestones in the process. Somebody needs to be checking whether those milestones have been met and needs to have the power to make recommendations to change the approach if those milestones are not being met. 
Um, in some systems, there's uh, legislative triggers, specific laws or legal requirements um, that require strategy adaptation. In some systems, the arrival of a new government, a new administration requires a review of the national security strategy. In some other systems, um, it can be linked to the budget cycle. So perhaps not annual, but on a large, longer cycle, um, the changes in budget may require a review of the strategy. Um, there may simply be a time, uh, a time limit on it. And in the end, um, ultimately, the most important determinant of how often it should be reviewed is whenever there is a serious need, and that becomes change whenever there are challenges in the security environment. So whenever the, the strategic or, or the regional or whichever aspect of the security environment changes in a way that the security sector needs to adapt to. So again, somebody within the administration needs to be responsible for monitoring that so that the review can happen in response at the right moment. Um, Dr. Feller, I think that's a good way of concluding our uh, conversation on the um, on the uh, on the monitoring and uh, and evaluation. And uh, as you said, it's a context specific, but this thing needs to be set out uh, in the uh, in the in the strategy itself. So, really, thank you very much for such a elaborate uh, explanation of the of the um, the, the periodic review. And, the, uh, and how often the, uh, the review should be. This is the last session of this round and indeed of our program, National Security Research Development and Implementation in Africa. Uh, please allow me to invite Ms. Kate Knopf, the Director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for a brief concluding remark. Uh, Kate, uh, you are welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, and uh, thank uh, uh, most especially to Honorable Jefferson, to Joachim, uh, and to Fairley for a, a truly practical discussion today. Uh, many uh, uh, insights that uh, I know we can all take away uh, and apply in our respective uh, responsibilities and positions. Uh, so thank you uh, for uh, grounding uh, this uh, whole discussion on national security strategy development and implementation uh, in some uh, key ways uh, that we can monitor, evaluate, uh, know if we're succeeding uh, in achieving uh, the key strategic objectives uh, that uh, these uh, documents and processes are meant to, to help us arrive at uh, to better deliver citizen security for all of our peoples. Now, I want to appreciate uh, all of our participants who've been with us in this round. Uh, and in fact, uh, many of you across all three rounds uh, of this virtual academic program program. Uh, we hope that uh, you have found uh, all of it uh, helpful to expand understanding, uh, to provide a, a shared space uh, for us uh, to have this dialogue with each other, uh, where we can uh, partially get to know each other as uh, best as we can over this virtual platform. Uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to, to very much to staying in touch and, and to hearing from each of you as we go forward and we all seek to catalyze strategic solutions. Uh, and uh, we hope take the mission statement of the Africa Center forward uh, in regards to national security strategies and in fact, all of our uh, efforts uh, to uh, advance the citizen security uh, across Africa. Now, please do continue to consult the toolkit uh, and uh, share with us your feedback. I know Dr. Luca will be very much uh, appreciative of that. Uh, we will be uh, in fact publishing uh, a second edition with even more materials and case studies uh, so we, now we'll rely on all of you to, to share with us as you continue your experiences. Uh, please do consult the website and uh, you'll find the videos from all of the plenary sessions uh, located there and from uh, many of our other programs as well. We hope those will continue to be useful tools and resources for you and for your colleagues. Uh, please do share uh, and please do keep us updated. Uh, as I said, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to know where you are, uh, what's going on. Uh, our community affairs team, uh, Claude and Elias and Louisa, are at your disposal uh, and uh, we'll welcome uh, to have uh, updates uh, on uh, new positions and responsibilities as uh, we all continue on our journeys. So thank you once again very much uh, for joining us uh, for uh, this session and for uh, so many of the sessions. We look forward to the final discussion group uh, session tomorrow and uh, we hope uh, to engage with each and every one of you uh, very soon once again. Thanks, Dr. Luca, back to you. Oh, oh, thank you very much, Kate. And I guess, uh, thank you, Kate, also for your leadership and for that you provided for this program. 
I think for, for I just want to thank all and each of you for such a journey. I think it is a worthwhile journey. I hope by the end of this journey, we have succeeded, succeeded in uh, living up to the objective that we set for ourselves. And that's it to, to meet uh, your expectation. We hope with this session, you will be able to go up at least with some tools and concepts that, you, that are necessary and important for you to share with your colleagues at home of how you can engage the process of national security strategy uh, in your country. It is not an easy job. It is a job that require a lot of uh, that will require a lot of work and and navigation and communication. I know your note to your the note that you are going to have uh, that a lot you can be sharing with your with your colleagues and uh, and your and your people at home. I hope we have done uh, uh, we have contributed in 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 creating a space for such a conversation. And uh, I hope we'll be a group of community of interest to build a coalition of experts on the continent of how to promote the national security as a development as a tool to deliver security to our citizens in the best possible way. So really thank you very much. And as Kate mentioned, we're becoming one community and we'll be relying so much on you.